Welcome to the Ordinary Extraordinary Cemetery, where every death had a life and every life had a story. My name is Jenny Johnson. Hello, and I'm Diane Hartshorn. This morning, as we are recording, we are doing a very normal episode for us. <laughs> very normal. <laughs> I actually had time to do some research because camp is over, which is fabulous. Not that I didn't enjoy the kiddos at camp or anything. It's just, it takes up a, a lot. lot of time. Yeah. So it, it was nice to have that um, wrapped up and ready to go um, for this year. And I apologize to those watching us on the screen. We're both like shutting down our phones because mine just donged. I don't know if anybody heard that, but it just donged. And I was like, oh, I should maybe turn off. No, my mine phone. just vibrated at the same time. <laughs> so it's like, that's why I was shutting mine down too. It's hey, early. This is, this is This is early for us. Yes. And I'm usually pretty good about remembering to put it on silent before we start recording, but I forgot this morning and I was pulling up the notes. We're trying a new format for you guys today. So because we are now doing this on YouTube, in addition to the audio version, we're going to attempt <laughs> to tell you today's story without using a full on script. Like I used to write before I created an outline of everything that I discovered during my research for today's story. And we're just going to kind of follow the outline, but hopefully this will be a little more conversational between us and we'll see how you, the listeners and viewers like this. Uh, if it's really clunky, we might go back to writing full scripts. <laughs> again. Right. And but then, yeah, definitely let us know in the comments. Yes. Please let us know what you feel, how you feel about this new so way then, of doing it. I was going to say, this is my first time eating it because I was texting Jenny last night. And so we decided to do it in the morning. She goes, I'll send you the script tonight. And I felt really guilty when I went <laughs> to bed, like about a, um, I don't know why I said it sounded like that. And then I'm like, oh, she's going to rush to get this done. And I went to bed and I won't read it. And I get up this morning and check my text. And it was like, she sent it at midnight so it's like but also she, i'm a night owl you you tend to be more of a morning person than i like you're yeah. up earlier and you're out and you've been doing like physical labor for the last couple of days at the cemetery yeah. so I'm not used to that stuff so <laughs> totally understandable that you are a little worn out so i there was no rush i just wanted to get it done and put together and um i just kept finding more stuff to add to it when i first started researching this story I felt like there wasn't going to be a lot, but then I was able to do some more digging and some more digging. And this is actually a story we could expand into future episodes if we wanted to talk about some of the descendants of the gentleman we're going to cover today, um, because his children have actually done quite a bit too. So, and we'll mention some of their stuff briefly towards the end, but I didn't get into a lot of what they did only because that would make this episode way too long. And it's about them too. And right. Because the gentleman we're talking about, his headstone is behind Jenny. And um, once you find, we find out, you know, once we share who he is and what he did, um, it reminded me when I first saw it, that of his invention, um, it looks to me like what I would like to soak in. <laughs> and I'll explain, right. that. I'll explain that more. That sound is so weird. In a moment. So actually, <laughs> I'm going to start this off today to ask if you are a bath taker me yeah. no because <laughs> this is gonna sound so weird that means i would have to clean my bathtub on a regular basis um so i'm a shower person but if i but when i stay someplace and i know the bath to, bathtub is pristine yes <laughs> i so i want nothing more than soap but growing up as weird as this may sound we didn't have a shower in our bathroom we just had a tub and i would spend hours hours in the bathtub until you know the water got cold I had to fill it back up and i did that several times so i am a bath take i love a bath and actually when we bought our current house so our old house we had you know a five piece what they call a five piece master bathroom and so it had a separate tub and shower and the tub was a soaking tub and i loved the soaking in the tub part um and when the kids were little, they loved it too. Cause it was like a big old swimming pool for them when yeah. they were really little and we'd fill it up. The only thing I hated about it because it's wider than it is long. It was a mm -hmm. pain to clean because I'm short. And so leaning across to clean it was never fun, but I used it all the time. When we bought this house, our master bathroom only has a shower. It's a very small bathroom. We gave up the big 
bathroom to have another bedroom actually in this house, which was fine, oh, but yeah. it means, uh, but fortunately the, the shared bathroom in the hallway, the kid's bathroom does have a tub. So I can still take my baths. And I do like you, I will take very long baths, but I will take my books. I will lay in it and read until the water is cold and I will refill it. And that's my favorite thing to do in the winter, especially once it's dark and I'm done with everything for the day, just go up and take a hot bath with my book and then go straight to bed <laughs> from there. I have a friend who has one of those soaking tubs. And I, when I go over there and I just, I just sit and I just look at it because it's like, you know, cause she goes out of town every weekend. I'm like, <laughs> If you need somebody to come over and babysit your tub, I'll do it. I'll, I'll sacrifice my time to come over and soak in your tub. Well, and someday, one day in the future, maybe I will have the ultimate soaking tub, which would be a clawfoot, a Victorian clawfoot <laughs> bathtub with all the fixtures on it and just, oh, they're so glorious. Um, that would require either moving though or being able to expand our master bathroom to include a tub of that size. Maybe we'll see in yes. a few years what happens. Mine so, is in the garden and they're, they're extremely heavy. So I don't think we could put one in our house without it falling through the floor. Yeah. You'd probably have to check weight limits and things like that. Yeah. But um, so this leads us to today's topic. Now that we've discussed our baths and our soaking and our bathing habits, you, <clears throat> thanks for indulging us listeners on that one. Um, we today, we are going to be discussing the life of John Michael Kohler. John Michael Kohler, um, we are, we could be so thankful for him because he founded the Kohler Company, which is best known for its plumbing products. But the company also manufactures furniture, cabinetry, tile, engines, and generators. And he is best known for creating the what we know now as the modern bathtub. Now, like Jenny and I were talking about before the episode, bathtubs and bathing tools, I guess, um, have been around forever. But usually, you know, there was the, not cast iron, but the iron metal tub. Some kind of metal tub. To, yeah. yeah. Or sometimes a wooden tub. <laughs> yeah. That you would have to fill with water, usually from the stove to heat it up or from, if you didn't have a stove, campfire, and then drain it and dump it. And, you know, it was always the stories, the last, the youngest kid would have the dirty bath water. But anyway, um, but he, Mr. Kohler, invented where or at it where you could have a drain and be able to fill the tub from possibly inside the house without having to fill it with buckets. So it's basically the modern modern plumbing, so to speak, as it was modern back in the what, 1880s? 1880s, yeah. And he um he was a very ingenious man. Like he hit his brain as we learn more about him, was going yeah. all the time. He was always thinking of things and very smart. Um, but he came from extremely humble beginnings, as so many of our um, subjects do. <laughs> but um, he had a huge impact on... Uh, Sheboygan, yeah, Sheboygan, Wisconsin. And when I read that this morning, it was funny because I was telling Jenny, it's like when my my grandmother first met my husband, Tom, and found out he was from Wisconsin... She asked him, do you know where Sheboygan is at? And he said, of course, he said yes. And he, her her dad, so be my great-grandfather, they lived back there for a time. And I think when his mother, so be my grandmother's grandmother, there we go, when they first came to the United States from Germany in the 1840s or 50s, they came into Sheboygan, Wisconsin. Because when I look on the map, I think it's like a port city. Which, yeah, it's right there off of Lake Michigan. Right, exactly. So that that was pretty cool. And I read that and it's like, oh, yeah, because he has um, many things named after him. The John Michael Kohler Art Center, John Michael Kohler State Park, the Kohler Memorial Drive, which is like the main highway into Sheboygan. So, so he definitely left an impact not only for us, but apparently for Wisconsin as well. Yes, definitely. And when you you talk about you said your grandmother was a German immigrant they mm -hmm. were immigrants from Germany which makes total sense there were a lot of 
in this part of Wisconsin. Yes. Um, there were a lot of German uh, immigrants that had come and settled there and Austria and what was Prussia at the time, all of those countries, there was a lot of, there was an influx at that time. So that's perfect. Um, as we go into John's story. So he was actually born in Austria um, in Schnepfen. I'm assuming I said that correctly in Schnepfen. In Austria on November 3rd, 1844. Uh, his parents were uh, Johann Michael Kohler and Maria Anna Musbrugger Kohler. Uh, and he was the fourth of their eight children. Unfortunately, four of those eight children did not survive past infancy. It looks like Johann, his dad was a farmer, which, you know, of course, that's a lot of there was a lot more farming. And I think that the, the um, Germans excelled at that because that's, yes, they were farmers and ranchers and they, and they worked, they worked hard and they, you know, they, that's what they did in Wisconsin. Um, unfortunately, his mother died in 1853. So John was only nine years old at the time. Uh, and it was not very long within months, Johan remarried. Uh, I could not, I was having a hard time finding the name of his second wife. I'm sure it's in there somewhere and I just wasn't having uh, luck finding it. Uh, and then after he remarried, so in 1854, the family immigrated to America. So John was 10 by the time they came here. Uh, they went via France. So they left from France to come to New York. And then from New York, they settled in um, Illinois for a very short time before moving on to St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, Johan and his second wife, though, went on to have another 10 wow. children. And from what I read, it sounds like all 10 of those survived. So really, John Kohler was one of 18 children, 14 who survived to adulthood, which is pretty cool. That is amazing. Um, of course, young John was um, his education. He attended the local schools. And I'm sure at the time had a normal school education. John, on his own, decided to move to Chicago in 1862. He was 18 years old, and he actually attended uh, Chicago's first business school. I, I don't say this. actually <laughs> know how to pronounce the name of this school. I'm assuming I'm it's Dyronforth College. It or close to Dyronforth. So I do believe the school still exists. So if any of our listeners want to correct us on that pronunciation, please do. <laughs> but, but I'm not even going to try to say it again. Um, and then he only attended for a short time, though he did not graduate, which I think that happens to a lot of people who, I don't want to say genius, but have that genius thing. Their, their minds are so busy and so going that sometimes in school is so, um, they're going, doing things without actually is teaching more theory. I don't know if this was the same back then, but these are the people like John who actually wanted to get out there, get their hands dirty and, and create what he was very interested in, which apparently was our modern day plumbing. Yes. And I also think there might've been some family stuff back in St. Paul, because he actually did return to St. Paul, um, where he took a job as a delivery wagon driver. So think of like the Wells Fargo delivery. Like okay. if you've ever watched the movie, The Music Man, you know, Wells Fargo delivery. So it was kind of that sort of thing. Um, but he really, really, really loved Chicago. So he it didn't stay in, be. right? It Well, yeah. and especially then it was like up and coming and there was all the new stuff happening. So he actually um, moved back in 1865 and took a job as a salesman for like a greengrocer. And then not long after that, he actually switched to becoming a, like a traveling furniture salesman. So he traveled all over the place selling furniture. And then he would remain in Chicago for about nine years. And he was determined to work hard and make a good impression on his employer. I mean, he come from very humble beginnings and from, I'm sure he learned from his dad, the value of, of hard work. And then the furniture sales job often took him to Sheboygan, which when you think about that now, furniture salesman, it's not like they could hop on Amazon and hop on any device or even, I don't even think the Sears catalog was available then to see. So they would travel and a lot of times they had like little samples of furniture yes. and, and you'll see them every once in a while, like on an antique 
roadshow uh, goes to show how we spend our evenings um like little miniature dressers and beds and that and this a lot of times they would take those and then he maybe deliver the orders later or i'm sure he had some of his you know ready full-size furniture to sell and deliver at the time and see so did it and he, like I said, he worked hard because he wanted to make a really good impression on his employer. And he oft, often went to Sheboygan, Wisconsin. And there he happened to meet a beautiful young lady by the name of Elizabeth, nicknamed Lily Volroth, who was a young school teacher. Lily's father, <laughs> Jacob Volroth, owned a small machine shop and foundry. So he actually became very good friends not just with Lily herself, but also with her father, which then all of this after a few years of him going back and forth between Chicago and Sheboygan, mm -hmm. he began courting Miss Elizabeth and they were married. On July 5th, 1871, they, they settled in Sheboygan, which makes sense. And together they had six children, <clears throat> Evangeline, Robert, Walter, Marie, Lily, and Carl. And so after John married Lily and settled in Sheboygan, he actually began working for his father-in-law in his machine shop. Um, his shop and foundry, it was a machine shop and foundry. So meaning they made cast iron in this case is what their foundry did. Um, and so the, their main products were farm tools, such as plows. They also made the cast iron stoves that we're very familiar with from that time period and other cooking utensils. So think like a cast iron frying pan, some of the other tools they used. Uh, by 1873 though, John was fully in charge of the shop. He actually purchased it from his father-in-law. Uh, and the name of that particular business at the time was Union Iron and Steel. Uh, and this is important because Jacob Volrath would go on to found Sheboygan Cast Steel Company in 1874 with his sons, Andrew and Carl. The company still exists today and is called Vol Volrath. Yeah. And that company actually went through a couple of name changes over time, but it's still owned by the Volrath descendants. So and cool. the John Kohler and his father-in-law worked closely together, but they owned their own separate businesses doing almost exactly the same thing. Um, and something I didn't include in here, but Andrew... Um, Jacob's son and so John's brother-in-law had spent some time in Germany this becomes important later to the story but he actually went to Germany to learn how to do enamel work um, because enamelware was becoming more and more popular at the time it was deemed especially for kitchen um, mm -hmm. dishes things like pots and pans um, but even things like your cups and plates and stuff it was deemed a safer product to eat off of and to prepare food from because of the coating of the enamel than just the straight up cast iron uh, although there were debates about this, but like a lot of people believed it was a, a safer method for preparing your food and eating your food in. So he had gone to Germany, which is where a lot of this enamel work, that part of the world is where it originated. Oh, that is so interesting because I have so many pieces from my family who were generational collectors. I will not use the word hoarders who did not throw <laughs> anything away. So I have so many pieces of the, what they call the splatter enamelware mm -hmm. that has the, you know, the blues and whites and grays. And I just, I just love it because it's just, it just says age and old. And, and then um, of course in 1873, and I think as some, sometimes we forget about this is that America was in the midst of a financial panic and depression and a lot of things i know for here in colorado it affected a lot of like the mining interest and all kinds of stuff that was going on and it would actually last until the 1890s so it wasn't just a, a short thing and some of this had to do with the expansion of railroads after the civil war so you would think you know we're in the civil war we get through the civil war and then this at uh, the rebuilding process and um which is why we have so many people you know from that part of the country here but then we're rebuilding we're trying to recoup um you know um not fortune so much it's just a livelihood and then we go into um a depression so to speak yeah some of the banks began to fail at the time mm -hmm. um there, there's way more to that story that I yes. did not even want to put in here because that's a whole nother 
10 episodes on its own, if you want to talk about that particular time in history. But it was a very risky time to start a new business because Mm -hmm. getting financial backing could be really difficult to do at that time because there was a lot of mistrust in the banks in um, and in the type of money that was being used at the time. He then entered into a partnership with Charles Silbertson. There was a notice in the Sheboygan Times on December 6, 1873. The undersigned, having purchased the interest of Mr. J.J. Volrath in the Sheboygan Union Iron and Steel Foundry, has formed a co-partnership under the firm name of Kohler and Silbertson and will continue the business of iron, steel, and brass castings in their various branches. So when they took over that business, they initially had 21 men working for them. And it was in a very small, like, wooden building. It wasn't very big. There wasn't a lot of room for expansion. Um, And 80% of their business um, was due to, again, the farm implements that they made. So feed mills, plows, silage cutters, saws. They made various kinds of saws um, and feed troughs. That was like the main portion of what they were making. They were making some other things as well, um, but that's mostly what was keeping the business going. And fortunately, even with the depression going on, farming was still very much a needed um, business. So the farmers still needed to purchase all of these implements Mm -hmm. and um, having, uh, and Wisconsin is actually, with the exception of the bigger cities, it is a big agricultural area in our country. So um, you had, again, we mentioned at the beginning, you had a lot of uh, immigrants coming from Germany, Austria, Prussia, those areas where they had been farming there and they brought their skills here and they set up their farming skills and agricultural business in the Wisconsin area. So obviously these guys were not hurting for cells because these farmers were going to need what they were making. Exactly. And they also, not only did they make um, farm tools and plows and stuff, they also made um, decorative fences, hitching posts. If you remember ever seeing some of the fancy hit, hitching posts that would sometimes have cast iron horse heads with the the ring for the, to for tie the, the, the halter through. Yeah. yeah. Um, lawn furniture and even cast iron cemetery crosses that well, I wanted to keep an eye out for cast iron crosses but um after the call i'm gonna have to go out into my yard because i have an old plow and i have a lot of farm implements from you know <laughs> generational orders that i'm gonna have to now go look at the names um of the companies because this would be very very interesting if i had some of these pieces which i wouldn't be surprised if i did well and if you have been following us on social media so our tuesday tidbit this week has to do with cast iron and wrought iron um, cemetery markers. Mostly that post was inspired, that blog post was inspired by my research that I was doing for this episode, but uh, they were very popular. And the fact that they manufactured them and actually in the research, and I don't have a picture to share with you all here on YouTube, but there was like a, an advertisement at one point that showed all these farm implements and all the things they're making, what you could order. And at the bottom on the right-hand corner were the crosses saying you could order these cemetery crosses and they were very ornate and swirled. Um, Being cast iron, they would have been made using a cast iron mold. So they would have had the mold pre-made and then poured the iron into this mold and it would have set up and then they would have shipped it out to any cemetery anywhere if you had um, access to their order form to um, be able to put that up instead of an actual headstone. So um, I just thought that was kind of a cool little tidbit that that their company happened to make those. So in addition to bathtubs, in 1878, Silbertson sold his portion of the company to Herman Hayson and John Stinn, who were German immigrants who had began working for the company as machinists. Uh, and then the company was renamed at that time as Kohler, Hayson and Stinn. And, and I love the fact that they started as machinists I know. and moved up into the business. That is so cool. Um, a fire in 1880 destroyed the small plant. But the business was able to rebuild on a new site that allowed them to expand. And now addition to the foundry and machine shop, an enamel shop was added. Enamelware had become quite popular in the U.S. by this time. We've already done this. Yes. Done. And I actually, I took a, like a side dive when I was doing the research into like how enamel was made and, you know, why it mm-hmm. was becoming so popular. And that's how I learned about the 
it became more safe, you know, as an option to eat out of. Um, but then it did talk about the different ways that enamel was made. There's like three very distinct ways. There's some other ways too, but the majority of it, there's three different ways where this enamel is made and then applied to products. Um, and I thought that was really interesting. So if, in my research, and this is where it got a little fuzzy sometimes between what the Kohler company was doing at the time with, with their stuff and also what the Volrath company was doing. So his father-in-law and brothers-in-laws, they were making the same sorts of things from their company. The other thing the Volraths made that was really important were the frogs for the railroad ties. So the frogs are the little parts on the tracks where the switches are at. So when a train needs to switch tracks, mm. that's called a frog. And so they, their company made those, um, but they were also in the process of doing this enamel wear. And I, I speculate, and I, I couldn't find definitive proof, but I'm guessing that John Kohler and his um, business associates probably learned some of their enamel stuff from his brother-in-law, Andrew Kohler, after he came back. So even though the Volrath company was also producing enamel wear, John Kohler also was doing it. I couldn't find anything that said like they were like butting heads or anything like that. It sounds like the family got along very well. They just own their own separate businesses and they just happened to produce the same types of products um, up until 1883. In 1883, John Kohler decided to add the enamel to the inside of a feeding trough. And this was a new concept. It hadn't been put in a feeding trough before. And, and this isn't like an animal feeding trough specifically, I think for, for hogs. Um, he added feet to it. So what we think of as our coffee and he added a drain and he sold that first one as a bathtub. That's what he sold it as. I don't know who he sold it to. I never came across that information, but he sold a bathtub. And that was really the beginning of Kohler's interest in like the plumbing side of things. Can you imagine? I'm going to, honey, I'm going to let you go. I'm going to go soak in the hog trough. Uh, you know, whatever, whatever works. Dear. <laughs> <laughs> I just think he, I, and I don't know, maybe there were some other things going on at the time, you know, this is Victorian society and they had grand ideas about things, but yeah, I, I'm just thinking mm -hmm. he's looking at this trough and they were very large, you know, and he's like, you know, if I put some feet on it, that raises it up a little bit, then we could put a drain in it. And then it would be so easy to get rid of the water then after you filled it rather than taking your bucket and like scooping it back out. Like, yeah, and it's and long enough. My guess is too, it was long enough. He thought for a whole man to like sit in it and soak. <laughs> and they had a big family. So it was like, that makes sense. Let's, let's make this easier for everyone involved. So, oh, maybe that was it too. Maybe he's like, you know what? We'll just pop the kids in one next to each other and get them all washed in one go instead of one after the other. Oh, one at a time. <laughs> yeah. That's what Who it knows? was. I don't know what actually led him to come up <laughs> with the idea, but that's, that's where it started for him. <laughs> then I know for me, when my kids were little, they took baths together because yep. was like one place they could not get into too much trouble. And it was like, <laughs> They were, they were contained. They were contained, and they had fun. And I had like half hour, an hour of quiet because the children were contained. Um, <laughs> but unfortunately, on March second, eighteen eighty three, Lily Kohler died at the age of thirty four. An account of her funeral service was printed in the local paper. The funeral of Mrs. J. M. Kohler at the residence of the family on Sunday afternoon was the most largely attended un of any that had occurred in the city for a long time. The remains of the deceased lay in a rich casket in the front parlor, looking quite naturally with a beautiful Kayla Lily in the right hand lying upon her breast. Upon the casket and upon stands at the head and sides of, sides of it were arranged a profusion of the most beautiful and appropriate floral tributes from friends, in varied designs to the memory of the deceased and symbolic of the new life upon which she had entered. The funeral services were performed by Reverend R. W. Blow of the Episcopal Church, by whom the deceased elder's daughter of Mrs. J. J. Bowrath was married on July 5th, 1871. The music service at the residence was by Mrs. L. D. Holly, Miss Ella R. Pelton, Mr. M.C. Patton and J.L. Mallory with a piano accompaniment by Mrs. Patton. I just love 
all the details. I know this is why I had to the, include this. <laughs> yes. So you, can, you can take it out. And about 75 vehicles were in the procession in the cemetery, at which place the Concordia Society sang a beautiful piece, in addition to the ministerial services there performed. Thus was shown the appreciation of the deceased and sympathy with the bereaved husband and children by the community generally. So I just had to include it because this one was so descriptive. The fact that it described how she was laid out, that she's holding this calla lily in her hand and all the, the flowers around her. And it had that very Victorian moment of they symbolized all these things going into her next life. Like it just kind of, I don't think I've read one similar to that before. So when I read that one, I was like, I have to include the full little description in there. And because I couldn't find um, like an actual obituary for her uh, that would, that talked more about her. I was like, we're going to, we're going to include this. Although I'm guessing that she was a big fan of music. I, I know he was a big fan of music, but I okay. think she might've been too, which is why there was probably so much music at her particular that service, makes- both at her house and at the graveside, it sounds like. Well, John didn't remarry as quickly as he did um, with after the death of his first wife. He remained a widower for several years. He did not marry, remarry until November 3rd, 1887 on his 40th 43rd birthday. He did marry Lilia's, Lily's younger sister, Wilhelmina, her nickname Minnie Volrath, and John and Minnie would have one child together, a son named Herbert. Now, yeah. I mean, that may sound weird to today's standards, but there are, in my research through, you know, researching people for, for so long, this actually happened quite often where um, the widow or may marry the sister of um, his deceased wife. Yeah, but I did find it interesting. So like when his own mother died, his father married within months to help care for, probably to find somebody to help care for all of their children that they'd had, right? He had four living children at that point and needed a wife to care for it because he was taking care of the farm. I, I found it interesting that John Kohler, it was several years, it was almost five years before Mm -hmm. he remarried after um, Lily died. Uh, and then he did finally remarry or marry Minnie. My guess is Minnie probably was helping a lot with the children anyway, with as many children as he had. It also may have helped that his oldest child was a girl and she probably did a lot of the household stuff and helped care for her younger siblings because that was quite common at the time anyway. So I just thought it was very interesting that it, he didn't remarry right away, even though he had a large family to, to take care of. He, he took his time. So, and I'm I'm assuming that Go ahead. Sorry. I'm hoping that means he and Minnie over that time, not only did he find a new wife, but like they probably fell in love and actually cared for each other at that point too. And I think his kids were probably older yes. than he was when his mom died, which True. makes a big difference. And it was more modern society than being a farmer on a farm. Right. Family, so. Yeah. And they weren't yeah. living in like his, his family in Austria Mm-hmm. was living in a rural community on a farm. He was not, not, he was living in the city of Sheboygan at this right. point. In fact, just a year prior to his or her death, sorry, in 1882, they started building their, their house, which still exists. The family, the John Kohler house, which was large, had a lot of rooms, very Victorian. Um, and it, so, you know, and it was right there in town. So I'm sure they had lots of friends and neighbors in addition to the children, in addition to his, um, in-laws family, which there were a lot of, um, siblings on the Volrath side. He had several brothers-in-laws and there were some other sisters too. So he had a lot of people to help him. Oh yes. And there's the house. Yeah. That is the John Michael Kohler house. Um, as it pretty much looks today, uh, gorgeous. which is gorgeous. Um, and that is actually now a part of the John Cole, Michael Kohler Arts Center. It's actually the art center, I think, is built onto the front of it. Uh, and they do all the theater and the dance and all of that in there. But this is a part of it. Um, and there are times when it is opened up to the public and you can actually go inside and see the inside of this very important building in Sheboygan. Well, just imagine come, came from such humble beginning beginning beginnings in Austria and then what he built up through hard work and tenacity because you would have to have tenacity oh yeah and definitely 
and this is his basically his legacy and that's really cool I love the um the tower you know the right here in the middle there yeah yeah that's one of my favorite things I'm sure there's like a window seat in there or something which I love a good window seat <laughs> oh definitely and not only you know did he have this beautiful house but he also gave back a lot to his community um John founded the local humane society in Sheboygan he was very active in charity work he had an appreciation of art and literature and music which we discussed probably with with his wife as did as well and he was a mason and a member of the independent order of odd fellows he was also a member of the County Board of Supervisors from 1881 and 1882. He was a city council member from 18 in 19, I'm sorry, in 1891. And he actually served as mayor of Sheboygan in 1892. And I mean, his story is the epitome of the American story. It really is. And you have to think about it. He didn't move to our country until he was 10. So he probably at the time spoke mostly German. Right. Um, so he would have come here. He went to school. We know he went to school and that's probably where he learned his English, mm -hmm. but he probably also still spoke German. Obviously he had German immigrants who worked for yes. him. So that came in handy because he could speak both languages, but yeah, he was able to um, build this glorious house. He built a fortune. He built this company that continued to expand and grow, even when it went through tough times, like the fire that burned down that the first initial shop. But you know what? He actually moved it, found a bigger space, expanded the whole thing and, and expanded what products they're making. And then by almost the end of that century, he had served as the mayor of his community and was very highly respected and highly thought of within Sheboygan and the surrounding area. It's such a yeah, great story. So from in 1873, he had 21 employees and his business grew to more than 125 by 1888. And by then the company was mainly producing enameled bathtubs and cookware. As well as additional plumbing items. So now we're getting to the point where indoor plumbing is becoming a possibility, at least for the wealthy. Mm -hmm. um, and so they were also producing the other items needed to have plumbing. So your pipes and your faucets and all the, the parts that go with that, that was all produced by them. Um, but at the, at the same time, John Kohler began to feel like the business was outgrowing the city of Sheboygan. So his plant was located like right in the city on a couple of corner blocks, you know, and it was all built up. And so he planned to move his business about four miles west to an unincorporated village, which at the time was called Riverside. And he ultimately wanted to create a model company town, which we've read about these company towns before, like the mining towns and stuff, which in theory are a good idea, but usually weren't very well run. Um, there were lots of issues with that. The, the companies were very controlling. They you know, had crazy rules and not great housing and all of that. Um, but John Kohler being John Kohler was right. determined to make sure that his town was not that kind of a town. Yeah, um, like in the a company towns, the mining, they took advantage of yes. mostly immigrants. Um, yeah. And but John Kohler came from as an immigrant came up. So he would definitely have a different perspective on the company town. So that, yeah, that's he, pretty neat he was not forgetting where he came from and where all these other immigrants were coming from. So by 1899, he had, he was now employing more than 250 people. So within that year, he'd almost doubled the size of his company. Uh, so he had a new foundry constructed in Riverside. Unfortunately, John Michael Kohler died suddenly on November 5th, 1900 of a heart attack. He had just celebrated his 50, 56th birthday and the marriage of his son, Walter, two days before. Yeah, there is a lovely description um, in the Kenosha newspaper because his daughter-in-law was from Kenosha and they'd had this beautiful wedding at the home of her parents and then, you know, went through the whole description of it. Um, and of course, he and his wife were in attendance. He and many were there. Uh, and I guess one other account I read said he wasn't feeling great during the wedding, but he, you know, pushed through yeah. and kept up with it, whatever. And then when he came home, he still wasn't feeling good. And then on two days after that, he, it was 
probably what we think of in today's terms as a widow maker. It just hit him really hard and really suddenly. And he was only 56. So he was pretty young by today's standards. <laughs> yeah. By today's standards. Um, he was buried in the family plot alongside his first wife in Woodland Cemetery. And the plot is marked by a large marble bench with the name John Michael Kohler carved on it. And if you're watching us on YouTube, you can see that bench here behind me. Um, it, it almost, I call it a bench. It looks more like a couch because it's got the two end pieces on yeah. it. Um, but it is large and you can see his name engraved on the back there. Uh, and then each of the other members that are buried within that plot, their graves are marked with marble markers. Uh, that are long and narrow. Um, his, I noticed, I, and I didn't look closely at some of the other ones, but his has like this really pretty vine detail around it. Um, and then his name and the year of his birth and the year of his date or of his death are on there. It's very simple and elegant without being over the top for somebody again. And we've noticed this a lot for somebody who was so successful and whose family was so successful. It's actually very understated uh, for his grave, you know, some of the wealthy Victorians, mm. they went over the top when it came to their grave sites, but the Kohler family did not. And here's a better picture that kind of shows several of the graves within the plot. And you can just see the markers laying atop the graves, nothing fancy, nothing too over the top. Very nice. Like you could go sit there and visit the graves and really enjoy being in that spot. And oh, I, I love, love that, that. it's, yeah, and I love that it's so surrounded by all those trees and um, the shade. Like, it's just gorgeous. It's a gorgeous spot to be. Yeah, because usually you see the family stone. It's a big stone usually in the middle. And then they mm -hmm. have everybody around them. But I love this, that it is like the bench where you can come sit and visit. That I mean, again, that was so ingenious. I, I don't and know if he designed think, it or not, but it's pretty cool. I think for him, family was definitely important. I think he had a huge influence on his own children. So I think having this place for them to come, like you said, and visit and be a family together or friends, friends could drop by and visit and, you know, yeah. give their condolences and, and talk to him about whatever. I just like the concept that it feels so friendly and open and a place yes. you want to visit um, in a time of mourning because, um, unfortunately, you know, Minnie was actually several years younger and she lived until 1932, I believe is what I saw. So that's his second wife. Um, they're all buried together, his first wife and him and, and Minnie, they're all in that plot together. Um, but you know, she would have been widowed and only had one child with him plus all her stepchildren, which at that point were mostly grown by then. Right. So it would have been a very different existence for her once his death happened. So I, I like to think that this was a good place where she spent some time after she lost mm -hmm. her husband. Unfortunately, though, he never got to see the completion of the company town, which was officially incorporated as Kohler Village in 1912. And I think this cemetery, I was having a hard time finding out information about Woodland Cemetery itself. There wasn't a lot available online and even the city's website didn't have a lot. So it's in or near Kohler Village. So I'm assuming it was probably started around the time of his death. I don't know that for sure though. Um, I, again, what I could find online was not a lot about the cemetery. So unfortunately I don't have any other information other than I do know they are still doing burials in this cemetery because I did see some more recent obituaries that came up as to graveside services there, but um, I didn't get a whole lot more on that. Um, his eldest son, Robert, was named president of the company in 1900 after his death. Um, sadly, Robert only lived another five years and he too died of a heart attack. So I'm guessing there was some sort of hereditary heart condition yeah. I mean, if you look at photos of them, and I don't have a photo of Robert, although there are some available, like they look like they're in good shape and good health. So I don't know what led to it, but Robert was even younger. He was only in his thirties when he died. So then his younger brother, Walter took over the company and he ran it for the next 35 years. Um, Walter also served as the 26th and 33rd governor of Wisconsin in his lifetime. So, so he cool. was, like I said, his children, there's a whole bunch of other stories that we could follow up on with the Kohler children, but I thought I'd mention that part of it. 
the, the company continues today and is run by the grandchildren and great grandchildren of John Kohler. I think in this day and age, that is so amazing because, you know, yes. more times than not, the kids don't want anything to do with the business they want and they sell it off or they're enticed by corporations. So, I mean, that's yeah, they reason, continue through it yeah, to buy Kohler products. Yeah. Cause um, after, after Walter was done running it, it actually went to the youngest son, um, Herbert. So that was the son that Minnie and John had together. And then Herbert, there is another Herbert Kohler. He had a son also named Herbert and his son eventually took it over and their children. And like, there's still Kohler's very much involved in the whole Kohler business. So, oh, that is so it has amazing. stayed in the family for more than 150 years now. So by World War I, Kohler was known across the country as a plumbing product manufacturer. However, however, during the war, as so many other businesses did, they produced mine, mine anchors, projectiles, and shells to aid the military. So, so often what they, their product-based business became a, a war product-based right. business. And I, I think they set aside producing their normal bathtubs and things for a little bit. Right. Uh, by 1920, the company produced an engine driven generator. This was really cool. I didn't know this about Kohler. I knew about the, the plumbing side of things because right. you see their advertisements and stuff for it all the time. But by 1920, the company was producing an engine driven generator marketed to those in rural areas so they could more easily have electricity because that was before we had electric wires right. going all over the country. Um, these generators were called electric plants and they became popular overseas, especially on old estates and in castles. Um, and then they are also installed in a lot of the national parks to give the national park, like the lodges and stuff that were being built in these national parks could have electricity that ran off of these generators. And then five of these electric plants were sent with Admiral Richard Byrd to the South Pole. That is so cool. Yep. And that's how they ran their radio systems and they had some electricity and they did all these things. So these like engines and they had actually, um, what I was reading from back in the 1880s, they had worked on another sort of simpler type of engine and you can actually see it in their um, catalogs. Um, and it was an engine that you could... Um, I'm not going to explain this very well because this is not my forte, but I know my dad has rebuilt these types of engines. He used to do this all the time, but you could hook up like a belt to it to help run some of your farm equipment and stuff off oh. of it. Um, and so they were, they had been playing with this whole idea of engines and electricity and, and getting things to run better for nearly the whole time that John Kohler had owned the company. Mm -hmm. It's just by the time Walter took it over, he was able to advance that. And he had probably had some engineers working for him that were able to, to figure this whole thing out. Um, so, and then of course we go into the World War II. Well, there was other stuff that happened between the twenties yes. and, and World War II, but during World War II, again, they kind of stopped their normal production and they were producing other um, things for the war effort once again for World War II. And then- and should say like in 2024, the Kohler company celebrated its 151st birthday. And I find that absolutely amazing in this day and age that it's American built, America owned, American owned and still in business. That's yes. And that's they Kohler company. last year in 2023, I was looking at their website, which they have a, a lovely timeline of their, their business and all the things that have gone on. Um, and they had some big celebrations last year to sell, to honor their 150th birthday. But yeah, Kohler is still going strong. You can, you know, today they're big into, they still do the, the electric generation, uh, electricity generators and things like that in a different capacity. Um, I think they're very involved in solar, um, solar power now and some other things. Um, and it's a worldwide thing for them. They, they, they still honor John Kohler's initial um, charitable giving where he was very charitably driven, the company is too. And they work with um, populations around the world that don't have access as easily to, to running water and electricity and things like that. So they really make that part of their story now. Um, of course, they're big into the design of your bathroom and, and your kitchen. And so you can get, you can still get all of those types of appliances and stuff through your, your sinks and your tubs and your um, fixtures, all of that. Kohler still produces all of that and has continued to produce that for years. So it is just a company that 
started because one man was determined to work hard and, and make something of himself and made something for his family that his family fortunately has continued to take pride in and, and be a part of. Definitely the American dream. I'm so glad you decided to share about the Kohler company because this was fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. And like I said, there's so much more to it that we didn't even cover today because so many of his children led fascinating lives, several of his sons. Um, interestingly enough, his three daughters never married. They lived in the Kohler house until they died. Um, so I, you know, I don't know the stories behind that, but I did read that none of them ever married. They just stayed in their home. Uh, and the, the pictures behind Diane now, if you're watching us on YouTube, so that's John Kohler. And then that's his first wife, Lily. That's a portrait that's currently hanging in the John Kohler Art Center that you can see of her. So that's that couple. I couldn't find photos of the two of them together or of him and Minnie together. Uh, there were plenty of photos when I was looking at um, documents on ancestry and stuff of the other children as adults. Uh, but it sounds like... Um, his children probably had a slightly easier life than he did oh, yeah. as far as like where they grew up and things they learned. But I think he also made them understand the value of hard work and caring for your community and, and taking care of everybody else. So um, because they obviously continued those traditions, um, there was an instance where they weren't big on unions. I will say that, or his son, Walter was not big on unions and what did take part in um, a huge strike that lasted for quite a while in the 30s. And I didn't get very far into that story. Um, again, deciding that because I wanted to focus on John himself, mm -hmm. we could maybe focus on the boys in another episode and what they did later in life. But I, they were a significant part of Wisconsin's history altogether, though, going forward and still are to this day. So thank you, Kohler family, yes, uh, for all that you do. The John Arts Kohler the John Michael Arts Kohler, oh my gosh, the John Michael Kohler Arts Center um, is something I, the next time I get back to Wisconsin, knowing that Sheboygan's not that far from Milwaukee, would be something cool to see because they definitely um, have a big presence in that community and somebody who's involved in the arts here, I think it'd be fun to go there and, and see what's going on. Um, well, definitely. And you know, the, um, the foundation of the Arts Center you know, the story behind it. And it, yes. so I think it would be even more impressive to see what this man built and because of what of his hard work and ethics and tenacity and all of that, that this is a byproduct of that. So that's, yes. I think it would mean even more knowing what you now know about him. So I'm glad I thought one night when I was taking a bath, who invented <laughs> the modern bathtub? And it led down this uh, whole avenue of John Michael Kohler and his life. Uh, I'm sure residents of Sheboygan and Milwaukee well know who he is and most of Wisconsin, but I figured outside of Wisconsin, a lot of us probably didn't know, even if we've heard of the Kohler company, didn't really know the story of the company and where it has led his whole family. So I'm glad I decided to jump down this particular rabbit hole and learn more about him. He's one of those American innovators that's right up there with like Henry Ford and Einstein, all these people that did so many things, but we just don't hear about him as much. Like, unless you're probably right there within that local community, you're not hearing his name the way we hear other names thrown around. So I will never be able to go to, no, I'm sorry. I will go to Home Depot and I will be able to regale Tom with all of this history. <laughs> the next time I see a Kohler bathtub faucet. It I like, love it. You know, and then he probably will lead me in the aisle someplace. I know. I think I'll be the same way now. Like I'll have an, a better appreciation yes. for Kohler products after learning this whole story. So um, thank you, Kohler Company. Thank you, John Michael Kohler. Uh, I know I, I just, it was exciting to, to learn this. And I would love, if anybody knows a little bit more about Woodland Cemetery, where he's buried and his family is buried, I'd love to learn more. There just wasn't anything online. So if you want to share that with us, we'll be happy to um, put that in a future awesome. episode because it looks like a lovely, peaceful, restful area surrounded by trees and, and greenery. And of course, this picture uh, was taken in 2006. And I wanted to real quick give some credit for the pictures that we have. Um, today, uh, because none of these were taken by Diane or myself. I found all of these online. Uh, so the John Michael Kohler grave sites, all those pictures uh, were taken by Joe Selinski. 
The coal house picture was provided by Deborah Shad, and I found that on um, ancestry.com. And then the portrait of Lily was also taken, the picture of the portrait was taken by Deborah Shad, which it's located at the Kohler Arts Center in case anybody wants to see it when they're there, they can see her. So and, yeah, and as dorky as this sounds, and Jenny's getting used to my dorkiness, when um, I woke up this morning, I was going through the messenger messages to see um, when she texted me and I saw the first picture of John. And the first thing that popped into my head was he looks a lot like Leonardo, Leonardo DiCaprio. I think it does. His, he's, he's a very handsome man. And Lily was beautiful. So and usually, you know, the photographs aren't that flattering so you can imagine what they look like you know in real life so very no but very his good photo is especially couple. like if you look at it for and for those for our listeners who aren't viewing it right now he's got like a twinkle in his eye he definitely has a little twinkle in his eye and there's a little bit of a smile around his face he's got he's got the the mustache goatee look going on that was popular at the time um, and he's wearing his suit. And I don't know if he's sitting outside of his house or maybe outside of his plant. I can't tell. He's also got like wavy, curly, dark hair. Yep. But yeah, he looks like a pleasant man to, you know, if you were going to go up and introduce yourself and talk to him, he just looks like somebody who would sit down and chat with you about business or his ideas, but also about books or about music and about things that he's passionate about. He just, he looks so sweet, but you're right. He kind of does look like a, an older version of Leonardo DiCaprio, mm -hmm. which Certainly. is not a bad thing. I'm, I'm, no. you know, Leo's my, age. well, he's slightly older than me, but pretty much close to my age. So th this is yeah. okay. If he ages this way. <laughs> exactly. We thank you for taking time to join us today for this ordinary, extraordinary chat to learn more about today's discussion. Please visit our website, the ordinary, extraordinary cemetery.com where you will find additional links in our show notes. And if you're watching us on YouTube, be sure to give us a like and subscribe to our channel, The Ordinary Extraordinary Cemetery Podcast. This really helps makes us more visible to others on YouTube who may also enjoy our podcast. And please don't forget to visit us on social media where we share all kinds of cemetery photos, quotes, tidbits, and more. We are on Facebook and Instagram at Ordinary Extraordinary Cemetery and on X at Ord Extra Sim. So O-R-D-E-X-T-R-A-C-E-M. If you enjoyed this or any of our episodes, please consider leaving a five-star review and a comment on Apple's podcast, Spotify, or directly on our website. You can also leave those same comments on YouTube. Uh, your positive reviews and enthusiasm for our show help others who love cemeteries and history to discover us and all of our ordinary, extraordinary stories. And if you're feeling extra generous and want to help support the podcast in a financial way, you can now buy Diane and I a cup of coffee, either through YouTube or on our website. Simply click on the coffee cup icon and it will allow you to make a donation. Until we meet again.